Uh, I wanted to thank like Todd and Danny for uh, giving us a spot on the schedule. I've just joined the Open Source Initiative as a general manager about a month and a half ago. Um, and so uh, I didn't know we had a slot, so I don't have slides, but I am willing to take questions and talk about our mission and talk about our plans and what we're going to be doing over the next year or two uh, to kind of cement our, uh, you know, our mission into more concrete action. Uh, for folks that don't know and are joining um, uh, and haven't heard someone talk about the Open Source Initiative before, um, the Open Source uh, Initiative is an organization that uh, stewards the open source definition. And so that's kind of um, the canonical place where we um, describe like what open source is and what kinds of licenses uh, qualify as open source and what kinds of licenses don't qualify as open source. And so um, that's, uh, that mission is um, one that we've been doing for over 20 years um, with a lot of different folks. Like uh, we're a nonprofit organization and um, have for a lot of our history been led by volunteers. And so that means we've had a lot of turnover, a lot of different faces, a lot of different projects uh, and a lot of different initiatives. Um, and folks have probably had lots of different conversations with people from the Open Source Initiative over the years about our work and the kinds of things that we're supporting. Um, I would say that one of the things that we do uh, a lot of is take a look at new licenses. And that's been something that's been happening a lot more lately. Uh, which I think is really interesting. It's kind of an exciting time to be part of the open source initiative when, uh, you know, we have so much excitement around uh, building new open source licenses that uh, work with new technology, work with new landscapes and things like that. Uh, that said, we're, you know, not um, redoing our mission and retooling it to do other types of work. We still uh, care deeply about open source and making sure that open source is able to thrive and flourish and that people have the resources that they need to do that. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. I can, uh, you know, talk a lot, but uh, that probably won't be as interesting as hearing from folks out here in the audience um, about what they've been, you know, what they've been wondering or what they've been meaning to ask the uh, open source initiative about our work and our plans and things like that. So. We did have a really interesting question from the uh, last session about um, how uh, newer licenses seem to have had uh, like a drift into uh, also covering patent law. And that's a really interesting development. Um, for a lot of software's history, it only covered uh, copyright law. And so uh, because software is something that you write, um, we have, uh, we've like used that as like, so you write software so it gets copywritten, um, which is a little bit of a kludgy fit also, like the, um, the idea of copyright was intended for like novels and um, plays and music and things like that. Um, and software is, uh, it, I mean, maybe your software is art and mine is just a set of instructions, but most software is like some combination of both. Um, and so copyright's always been kind of a weird fit. So the, um, the we've had to, in open source more broadly speaking, respond to the, um, legal landscape where patents are being applied to software. And so that's been really uh, like a huge change that I think the OSI has embraced. Um, and so there's been some questions like, what else are we willing to embrace? Um, I don't see any huge uh, sea changes in like the legal landscape where, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna start applying some other uh, kind of field uh, or other type of intellectual property law to computers and software. I feel like um, the biggest changes are not as likely to come from the legal landscape. Like already having patents and copyrights apply to software is kind of a lot and already plenty of mess um, for folks who are trying to just use software and try and figure out like what they can do and what they can't do. So having like two different types of uh, 
laws apply to the writing and sharing of code is, is plenty already. But where I do think we might see more stuff is um, the ways that hardware and software relate to each other, which has been getting uh, kind of like a more deeper and interrelated, intertwined sort of relationship over the years, where it's a little bit hard to tell, like, where does the um, hardware end and the software begin? We do have like small chips that have like just a few lines of code running on them or um, other little tiny pieces that in your smartphone probably has like 30 different little devices that each have a little bit of code in them. And so uh, I think we are probably going to have to look at some um, new types of licenses that apply better to the mix of hardware and software that's, you know, obviously going to just keep happening. Um, I don't know if folks have other thoughts about like what places we think more licenses are going to be needed or um, other places where they think more of the um, you know, like that we're gonna have to respond to another change in the landscape, either the legal landscape or the technical landscape. Um, but I would be happy to talk about that with folks. If people wanna ask questions, you can put questions either in the chat or you can uh, put them in the Q&A. Like I can see them both, uh, the Q&A is like down in the middle. And uh, I would be happy to talk with folks about uh, how they think the OSI is doing, what they think we, should be looking at and what they uh, what they're wondering if we take a stand on or um, have uh, have been thinking about because that's it's a big growth here for us which um, is new uh, if you were in Josh's last session he talked about nonprofit organizations more broadly um, the open source initiative is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's a charitable mission based organization that has a, a charitable mission based focus to uh, educate and uh, advocate and make it easier for people to adopt and use open source. And so, um, so we stand by that. Um, but uh, like many things, after over 20 years, it needs a little bit of a refresh. Uh, and so we've been looking at more strategies that, um, you know, kind of meet the current moment a bit better. And so we've been having a lot of these conversations uh, within the organization. Um, if you've ever been part of a nonprofit, um, taking some time to sort of realign and look at your activities and seeing how well they are accomplishing your mission for you uh, is a super valuable process. I highly recommend it. Uh, myself, like before coming to free and open source software now like 15 years ago, I did a lot of work in uh, more traditional um, nonprofit organizations. And so those organizations uh, all kind of did this like check in with their mission and just like talk about what we're doing and how well our tactics and strategies are working each year. Um, or every other year. And um, I was a little surprised when I came to free and open source software nonprofits that we never did that until now. So that's exciting. Um, again, if folks have questions about like what we're up to or what we're doing, I would be happy to hear um, or take questions from folks in the audience. Um, for folks just joining us, uh, Todd and Danny from the All Things Open organization were um, gracious enough to give us a slot here. And um, so I, I don't have slides in particular. I was more kind of interested in what uh, folks have been thinking about and what folks think is happening with the, um, uh, the you know, the state of open source and, um, and where we could be going. So I don't know if people have some questions. Uh, so we have one from uh, from Josh Simmons. What are the best ways to get involved with and support OSI's work? That's a good, easy one, right? Um, thanks, Josh. Uh, if you go over, you can take a look. Like we have, uh, we have, we definitely have a mailing list that we send um, that we send out to folks and talk with them. We have ways for uh, people to volunteer and get involved with some of our working groups. If you are part of another open source project. Um, we have an affiliate program. Uh, today, we just added the .NET Foundation to our list of affiliates. Um, affiliates are able to participate in quarterly calls about the like open source at large and what's happening in the community. Um, 
so, like sometimes commiserate about shared challenges, but also like talk about resources that they found. Um, they uh, our affiliates like often share each other's opportunities and events uh, and things that are coming up that could be of interest to the larger community and not just their uh, sub project within the open source community. Um, we uh, also, of course, have a membership program where you can be part of our membership and elect our board and um, have some input on the direction of the organization from that sense. Um, that's just one perk. Of course, you can also, um, we, we love like keeping our members informed about what's happening and what's going on with the organization. Um, and as we are adding more like kinds of, or like kind of refining our mission, like there's gonna be more uh, opportunities to get involved in those uh, in those committees and in those working groups. Um, and we're, we're looking to sort of deepen our engagement with our affiliates. And so, um, so there'll be a lot of stuff coming down the pike. Um, we, um, let's see. Um, if uh, we, if folks have like specific things that they'd like to do, like if you, if you really like licensing, we have like a mailing list where people discuss that. Um, you might not be staying a mailing list forever, but um, there is a lot of like conversation on there. Well, sometimes there's a lot, and then sometimes there's none for a little bit. It goes up and down, uh, and so uh, that's another place where people can. Um, participate. And we're looking at more ways to kind of like convene conversations so that folks can um, discuss the uh, things that are happening with other practitioners. So we want to really make sure that um, folks who are doing open source are able to talk with other folks that are doing open source, like whether from a business perspective or like a hobbyist perspective or as a student. Um, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I don't know if uh, people saw uh, Josh's talk, maybe they got like a lot of their questions out there. Um, he talked more deeply about like kind of the wide range of nonprofits in the space that are doing free and open source software. Um, and one of the things that we're looking to do is to work more with partners um, that are also working in this space and doing uh, work on you know, to promote and advocate for open source. So, um, so we're, we're always open to conversations with other organizations. Uh, so that's another thing that uh, if you are part of another project and you think that there might be places where we could collaborate, we would love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know, um, maybe people are being nice and they don't want to ask like the question they have, or they think their question is maybe too minutia, but, um, if you have something that's a little bit more, uh, you know, nuts and bolts, we can talk to that too. Uh, so I have another, uh, what do you view as the most challenging things, uh, facing OSI and open source more broadly? Uh, that's a really interesting one, and it gets a little bit more uh, philosophical. Um, I would say that right in this moment, one of the things that we have is that we have like a really kind of like heavy in one direction, like folks who have been here for a long time um, and have like a really specific idea of like how open source should be done. And, um, and a lot of times they've created organizations that are, or projects that um, are, have kind of forgotten how to be welcoming to newer people and how to bring in like fresh voices and fresh perspectives. Um, and, but at the same time, we have like a lot of newer and often younger people who are doing open source. They're just not like plugged in um, in some of the ways that we would want them to be like, they just happen to be doing open source. Like I've had this experience before when I'm talking to someone about like what they work on and they're like, Oh, I do JavaScript, you know, no open source or whatever. And I'm like, Oh, JavaScript's usually open source. Um, so you are probably working on open source. So we have a lot of opportunity where folks are doing that work, but they're not, 
um, plugged in and they, uh, they don't maybe have as many of the resources that we would like to be able to provide or they don't know where to look for the things that um, maybe folks who have been here in the open source communities a little bit longer take for granted. So like um, I know you mentioned the open source definition and said like you were surprised to find out that there were people who had been doing open source programming for a while but didn't know about the open source definition. And so, you know, we're, uh, I think like as a movement, like open source didn't really start with, um, an innate love of marketing, say. And so um, so that's, I think, been a little bit hamstringing us as far as like fully embracing, like, oh, we should be doing our messaging, we should be doing our marketing, <clears throat> we should be creating materials for newcomers and resources for newcomers so that people who are not yet here have a really clear sense of what open source is, why we do it, why we think it's important. And um, we haven't done the greatest job of that. like. Uh, it's part of it's like a little bit messy. I think it's not always clear where people are coming in. Like we, um, I mean, maybe one day we would have a presence at every single university where every single person who first learns to code is showing up. Um, but, you know, it's one of the great and then like kind of uh, like challenging things about um, learning to code is that you can do it at home anywhere. So you might, you might learn it without learning some of the things that uh, would really help you out. And I mean, that's true technically, but it's also true as far as like the uh, way that uh, open source is and why you can't mix certain code bases with other code bases or why you have to talk to your, um, you know, the folks who are, you know, doing the business piece of your organization before you incorporate a giant code base into the work that you're going to sell to clients and customers. Um, you know, and so like a lot of it's like, oh, it didn't occur to me that I would have to talk to someone in another department before I brought a giant code base from outside into like our technical work. Um, I think that part's getting a little bit better, at least at larger organizations, although I think it was maybe just a year ago. Um, someone added me on Twitter and said, you know, like I, this copyleft license, I can't believe that you all set up this honeypot. And I'm like, it's, it's like a, I don't know, like a 20 year old license. It's not exactly like this secret honeypot. Like there's a whole website about it. Um, and I'm sorry that you incorporated a bunch of code that you found out on the internet without understanding why that wasn't the way that didn't go the way you thought it was going to go. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to like echoing what Josh said in his uh, previous conversation um, that obviously points to a lot of opportunity for us here at open source to do a better job of making sure that when folks type in like what is open source like into like a search bar they get an answer that is maybe not only just a list of licenses but uh, talks a little bit about the ethos and the community and some of the places that you might plug in and some of the resources that you might need to kind of get started, um, you know, between like a list of licenses and, um, you know, whatever you are encountering, like at school as you learn to code or at work as you uh, learn to be part of a business operation. So, um, so yeah, some of those, it's uh, like, I guess like none of those are like bad challenges. They're good challenges. I hope that we meet them with enthusiasm and um, and a little bit of humility. We're trying to uh, kind of channel our own earlier selves when we didn't know literally everything there is to know and we didn't have opinions about every single license out there and you know, that type of thing, you know, you didn't have like a hierarchy of six favorite programming languages and things like that and try to channel a little bit of that, uh, like, what was it like when I first got here and didn't know all the things there are to know? Because we've been, now we've been doing this for a long time, so there's a lot of information out there. Um, and some of it is, some of it's not great. <laughs> um, and so I think we want to um, be kind of like singing with one voice and making sure that we're uh, directing people to like good, solid sources of information. Um, not stuff that seems like legal advice from like a random person on a message board that isn't a lawyer, but like stuff that's been vetted and looked at uh, by people who know what they're doing. Um, stuff that is, you know, 
uh, like reasonable, like actually kind of encapsulates like the current general thinking about like how you use these licenses and like how you set up an open source programs office or how you do open source at work. Um, and so that, you know, we're all kind of like coalescing around a single uh, body of best practices for those things. So that's the challenge that we have to meet. And that's the way that I think we have to meet it. So I hope that we're, we're excited to do that as a larger community. Um, I don't know if we have other questions. Huh. Oh, that's a good one too. Um, we've seen a lot of people experimenting with licenses. Do you have any advice for folks who aren't licensing experts trying to make decisions about what license they should choose? That's a really interesting one because I feel like I've been answering that one for 15 years um, because there are a lot of licenses and now there's even more just in the last few years. Um, the... The first place to start on that conversation or that decision tree would be, are you writing code for work? Because if you're writing code for work, the first person you need to speak to is your boss. Like you cannot choose a license and put stuff out there without talking to your boss, unless you don't want that job anymore. Um, but you do you. If you want to keep that job, you should talk to your boss. Uh, the next thing you should do is if you are building like a module or an add-on or a library or, an you know, like another piece of functionality on top of a giant platform of other code, you should look at the license that that other code is using. So if you want to put something onto the Linux kernel, it should be compatible with GPL v2 because the Linux kernel is under the general public license version two. So if you choose a license that's incompatible with that license, then you can't add something to that code base. So like code bases get mixed and match. Um, Perl has its own license. So if you're writing Perl modules, you're probably gonna use the artistic license, which most of the Perl community does. Um, and this is, I'm kind of assuming that you want people to use your code. Like if you're doing open source and you're thinking about open source licenses, then I'm kind of assuming that you want people to use your code. If you're trying to, I don't know, like do something weird or troll people, like that's a different decision tree that I can't help you with. Um, but so look at the, the thing that you are putting your code on top of. So if you're joining an existing community, it has to match. Um, if you're writing your own thing from scratch, then I would say, take a look at what do you want to do with that thing? Like what kind of relationship do you want to have with other contributors and users? And um, like, are you monetizing the hard, like, are you selling hardware? If you're selling hardware and your goal is to get lots of home tinkerers to write lots of cool code and programs to work on the hardware you're selling, then you want to make it open like choose a, at the very least a permissive license. If you think that you might be in a really interesting, like exciting patentable area, you probably want to choose a permissive license with a patent clause so that you don't get sued for patent infringement. Um, and then if you want to make sure that people share their changes back and don't just like run off with them, then you want to choose a copyleft license. So it, it depends a little bit on your use space there. I love copyleft. I think it's great. And it helps you have uh, like it, it helps you create a community where people give back and they freely contribute on each other's stuff, um, you know, and then it, but it's it, because of the way that software as a service works like sometimes copyleft doesn't really work as copyleft because it's on your own server. Um, I also worked on a project called Media Goblin that used the AGPL. So we were trying to create like a really exciting um platform for sharing media that was like not uh, specific to a type of media. So you could put your speeches, you could put your songs, you could put your movies, your music, your uh, ASCII art, your photos, whatever, all in one place, like designed around you. And then we've discovered there's like all this stuff about like sharing on the internet that's really there are some like really hard problems that when you're doing a smaller instance that you need to solve. So we wanted people to like come to Media Goblin and then add stuff and then feel uh, like they ought to return their changes to the large body of code in Media Goblin. So we chose the Faro General Public License for that. I'm not a lawyer. No one should take that uh, long conversation about theoreticals as legal advice, but um, 
yeah, you really want to think through like what kind of relationship do you want to have with your contributors? How important is it to make it really easy for people to add code to your code base? Um, and like how important is the excitement around whatever you're building going to be for you to get the word out? So the more um, the more you want to have people like, contributing and, you know, feeling invested in the code base that you're building, um, the more likely you're going to want to pick like a good modern open source license. So I hope that answers like anyone's questions who are thinking about like how to do that. The, um, the experiments, I think, like those are going to keep happening. It's really like, I think for us at OSI, um, don't write your own license if you kind of, if you didn't do any of the thinking that I just talked about and you kind of painted yourself into a corner where you forgot to talk to the folks who were responsible for business and sales at your company before you chose a code base and a platform to build on top of, like don't come and then ask us to write a carve out for open source for you um, or to rubber stamp a carve out for open source for you. Um, take a look at the licenses that are there. That's not to say that we would never consider a new license. There's definitely, like I said, I think the, you know, the uh, dissolving relationship between hardware and software, there's going to be some new licenses that are going to come down the pike there that um, we're going to look at. And uh, we, I'm not saying we're going to take all of them. Um, it has to be written in a way that other people can understand and use and uh, and feel like they, they have a reasonable expectation of what the license does. Um, but we probably are going to have to uh, approve a license like that at some point. So I hope I hope a good one comes a little earlier rather than later so we don't discourage people. But um, and there may be other places like with the experiments as far as like what people are doing. Um, you know, it's uh, data might be another place where we see some new licenses coming in. Um, and, you know, that that might get a little that might get a little squishy too. Um, or might we might decide that belongs to like an open science foundation or something instead. We'll see. I mean, what I'm saying is don't be afraid to consider the possibility of new licenses if you've exhausted all the existing licenses and nothing meets your needs. Um, but you should, when I say exhaust, I really, you should really exhaust the list of existing licenses. Um, all right. Uh, I don't know if folks have more questions about uh, what we're up to, what the OSI is doing. Um, let's see. Or more, uh, more things I'd like to ask about like the affiliate program or the license review process, or um, you know, Josh uh, mentioned in the last talk, but if you weren't there, we are gonna be doing some hiring in the next few months, um, specifically for an executive director, but also for like some folks to do community management and some communications work. And so, um, so that's, uh, it's, it's a really exciting for a small organization to go from one staff person to like two or three or four. Uh, huge growth, huge opportunity to have a lot of impact on uh, the way that the organization feels and interacts with the community for the next few years. So um, I hope you'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, let's see, any other stuff that people wanna ask about? I don't know if folks are feeling shy. Hmm. I'd just like to give you your 15 minute warning. Okay, thank you. Cool. So, um, yep. If, um, if people are quiet or they wanna ask questions offline, I'd be willing to uh, drop an email into the chat so that um, people can, like if you have a question that you didn't wanna ask in public or in front of the group, that's also okay. So um, any questions either about the job openings that I mentioned or um, how to get involved or how to bring a project into our affiliate program 
or um, how to get involved with one of our working groups, uh, all of those queries can go to GM at opensource.org. And I read those and take a look at uh, what's going on there or if folks have ideas um, about other things that they'd like to see or they think that, um, you know, they'd like to see on the website. The website is probably due for a little bit of a refresh. Um, we'd be happy to hear from you about that. So, um, yeah. So Josh says, what are the current job openings and what are other openings uh, that we anticipate in the coming year? I'll drop in a link for the current opening. We are currently looking for someone who is um, able to help us with relationship building and uh, fundraising. And so um, that one is a sustainability coordinator. Um, I'll type that in. And so that rule is it's it's 10 hours a week, pays $30 an hour. Um, it's probably either someone who does this in a couple of other places, like as a fundraising uh, professional or um, someone who knows everyone and is interested in keeping their hand in while they're pursuing uh, classes or uh, graduate work or something like that and doesn't want uh, to look for full-time work at this point in time. Um, you know, we're, we're open to whatever, but that's kind of what I imagine uh, is fitting in. So if you can think of someone that is in that zone and is looking to uh, be involved in open source and be building relationships and helping us uh, plan for the future of the organization in that way, like, please feel free to send that along. Um, we're definitely an equal opportunity employer. And so we um, are interested in, you know, any, any way that you can help us get to like a more diverse pool of uh, applicants would be very much appreciated. Uh, some of the uh, the next big thing that's coming up, we're probably we're going to be hiring for an executive director, and we're also looking for someone to do communications. And so those are two big things. The executive director role is still in the process of being um, kind of tooled and described. Um, there are a lot of if you have much experience with nonprofits, there are a lot of different ways that executive directors function at very large organizations. They just show up at news conferences and galas, we're not probably looking for that kind of executive director. We're a pretty small organization. Um, so the, you know, the person will not be spending a lot of time in makeup, but be spending a little bit more time um, doing work. Uh, and so, so it'll be, it'll be like a, like a high amount of hands-on um, work with a, with a small nonprofit organization. So that's, you know, and when we have that post, um, I hope that you will all take a look. Uh, the communications or community management role is also not quite nailed down, but um, you know, will encompass a lot of the traditional work that happens in those kinds of roles. So like helping us um, do more outreach, helping us make sure that we're curating great content and um, convening great conversations with people around open source and um, the tools and resources that people um, have been asking for or would like to provide or the conversations they would like to have with each other and sort of sussing out what that is. So it'll be like a fairly traditional like community management, like communications type of role. And so that'll be coming pretty soon. Um, if you, if you want to um, recommend people to us, you can send the GM at opensource.org email. Like you can say like, hey, my friend so-and-so, like here's their LinkedIn profile. Don't give me like super personal information without somebody else's consent, of course. Um, but if you want to send me somebody's public LinkedIn profile and say, take a look, I think this person would be great. Um, I would be happy to contact them about the role when we have the openings. 